things about living in Bungie are good pubs, great climate, like Costa Rica, bohemian people and ladies with beards mixing <laughs> happily together. <laughs> If Bungie was an animal, it would be a chicken. Because of chicken roundabout, of course. <laughs> Mark Steele's in town. Thanks. Thanks very, very much. Welcome to Mark Steele's in town, which this week comes from the Fisher Theatre in the East Anglian town, or Hamlet, really, of Bungie. <laughs> One of the reasons why I really and honestly enjoy being in Bungie is it's because it's the only place everyone still calls me boy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I just love knocking on random doors so I can hear people go, what's that, boy? <laughs> it's such a lovely, warm, unthreatening accent. Nobody could be nasty to someone when you talk like that. The bailiffs could come round and go, right, you owe us all the money. We're taking all your stuff away. And if you went, would well, you want a cup of tea before you start, boy? <laughs> oh, I can't do it. I just can't do it. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was doing a show a little while ago in Suffolk, and I thought, I've got to try and listen for the accent, because if I get the accent wrong, uh, you know, people get very cross. And I realised I was miles out with how a Suffolk accent goes, because how a Suffolk accent actually goes is basically when we bought it, it was just a barn. <laughs> We have to be honest, you are miles away here in Bungie, uh, from anywhere, really, I, it seems. I, I made a typical towny mistake the first time I came up here, um, because I came up here by train, and I got as far as Ipswich, and I missed the train to Beckles, so I asked the information man... Uh, when the next one was, and I thought after a while, this doesn't look good, because he was flicking through his book for a long time, <laughs> and then turned over to Thursday. Because <laughs> uh, there's just that one single line, and it chugs along at such a speed that after a while you think, did I make a mistake and wander onto the broads and I've got on a barge? <laughs> <laughs> But when you, uh, you get here, it is it's very sweet and petite, and you have to get used to the fact that the pace of life is just a little slower. Uh, <laughs> I went to the museum that's right over the road here, and the lovely woman there, she said, uh, well, we shut for lunch in 15 minutes. So I thought, well, I should be all right. I'll have a quick look first, and then I'll come back after lunch and look round the rest. But, in fact, uh, I made it round <laughs> before lunch. With 14 minutes to spare. <laughs> I also love the way that, as you're not the most accessible place, the shops in Bungie just sell the most essential items. So in the main shopping area by the Buttercross, I notice there's a shop selling fine wines, and there's another one selling handmade furniture, and then there's the museum, and there's a family mediation centre. <laughs> You're not bothered with frivolities, <laughs> such as food. <laughs> Imagine people sit here and go, what we go do of an evening is we sit in our wicker chairs, drinking Chateau de Marcotte 65, discussing the Roman coin that we've been looking at in the afternoon. <laughs> I say it was from third century. My wife says it was from the second. We get all hit up and rowing. Then we can just nip to the mediation centre. <laughs> Very calm and stand, work out beautiful, see? <laughs> There's an electrical shop here run by Roy, and the reason I know this is because when I asked on Twitter if anyone from Bungie would like to say anything about the town, somebody wrote, Roy from Bungie sold a cordless drill and power pack and later received it as a Christmas present. <laughs> Minus the power pack. <laughs> So, uh, Bungie is a town of uh, around 5,000 people. It's nestled in a loop of the River Waveney on the border between Suffolk and Norfolk. This isn't just Bungie, it is historic Bungie. The slogan on all the signs is the charismatic and beautifully thought out, Bungie, a fine old town. <laughs> it's a bit half-hearted, isn't it? <laughs> 
<laughs> what was the other one that got debated as an alternative? <laughs> Bungie. It's all right, I suppose. <laughs> historic though it is historic because you've got a castle and you're clearly very proud of the castle there's a, a website and there's loads of signs for it there's a novel called Bungie Castle there's leaflets all across Suffolk telling you about day trips there the only thing is there's not really a castle there's <laughs> There are a couple of bits that I suppose, if you look at it from certain angles, you can see were once part of a castle. But philosophically speaking, that doesn't make for a castle. I mean, I did think, don't be judgmental, Mark. Um, yeah, let's see what it says in the Bungie Castle Trust pamphlet that they sell there, which I've got here in my hand. And this is how the pamphlet starts. When Parson James Woodford visited the castle site in 1786, he was obliged to pay sixpence for the privilege and recorded in his diary, it was scarce worth seeing. <laughs> That's from the tourist pamphlet! <laughs> A few sentences later, the pamphlet says... Although not one of the country's largest Norman keeps, Bungie's castle's claim to fame is it has the thickest walls. These walls make it one of the most impregnable strongholds in the kingdom. <laughs> well, they might do if they were attached to anything, <laughs> such as a castle. I'm not a military strategist, but I would have thought an invading army might have one option of overcoming these walls, which would be to walk round them to the other side. The, uh, the castle does, of course, sell itself in a more serious way. There's a little cafe at the entrance with a board that says, We sell the best hot chocolate in Bungie. <laughs> That's quite a claim, isn't it? <laughs> Better than the hot chocolate in the handmade furniture shop or the estate agents? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, I was in there this morning in the cafe. And it is very pleasant. And the hot chocolate is perfectly fine. Uh, and I was starting to feel a little bit bad, actually, about being sniffy about the castle. And then the woman in there, all of a sudden, she shut the door and she said, no one's allowed out today because bits keep falling off the castle. <laughs> <laughs> I do think if ever there was a medieval battle there, the invading commander must have said, I have a plan for defeating the castle. We will buy a hot chocolate and wait half an hour until it collapses of its own accord. <laughs> uh, uh, I met someone in there called the Reeve. Now, this is something that makes Bungie truly unique because you've retained the post of Reeve, a position that's died out in the rest of Britain, did after the Industrial Revolution. But uh, no point in rushing these things. <laughs> I can't quite figure out what the Reeve is supposed to do, but he came into the castle to meet me, dressed in this big purple cloak, uh, and he had all these chains on, and he had this sort of beret that goes about three feet wide. <laughs> and then he said, so what is it exactly that you do on the radio then? And I said, well, I, I go to towns and uh, I sort of take the mickey out of them, I suppose. <laughs> and he said... Well, I trust you shan't be taking the mickey out of the Reeve. It's a very serious post indeed. <laughs> now, I thought, yeah, all right. Well, look, the trouble is, A, there's nothing else here. And B, you're in a purple cloak with a three-foot-wide berry, so I'm not sure I can help you, really. <laughs> I'm sure the Reeve does have many, many important functions. Uh, the only one I could understand was that it's the Reeve's job to appoint next year's Reeve. <laughs> I said, once you've made your mind up, uh, aren't you tempted to make some money by putting a few bob on it through contacts with a dodgy Far East betting syndicate? <laughs> uh, I don't think you appreciated it. <laughs> there is... Um, of course, a, a fascinating history to the town, as you can tell from some of the poetry that has been written about it. For example, this particular poem, which was very popular around here in the 18th century. Beckles for a Puritan, Bungie for the poor, Halesworth for a drunkard, and Bilborough for a whore. 
Uh, it might not be the first thing to spring to mind about that poem, but it does suggest that anyone who thinks this area is just twee and uh, cosy has clearly got the place wrong. Now, to start with, the events of 1577, uh, when two people were found dead in St Mary's Church after a thunderstorm. Now, according to one account from the time, there appeared in a most horrible manner a dog of black colour, the devil in such a likeness, moving with great swiftness and wrong the necks of the two persons as they prayed. This story of the devil coming in the form of a black dog has stayed with the town ever since. There's black dog antiques, black dog books, there's the black dog running team, black dog football team, the town's logo that you can see all over the area is a black dog. Because the most natural thing, it seems to me, to do once you've had a visit from the devil... <laughs> is to make it a symbol of the town. <laughs> is that what you tell your visitors? You go, see that dog over the town hall and on the weather vane and everywhere? That's devil, that is. <laughs> we love him round here. <laughs> you staying in Bungie tonight? <laughs> Sweet dreams. <laughs> Uh, Abraham Fleming, who wrote the original account, was certain that the dog was sent by the great power which the Prince of Darkness hath recovered. And his personal theory as to why the dog came to Bungie was, we tumble still upon the bed of wantonness, drink ourselves drunk with the wine of sensuality, and lie wallowing in the sink of sodomitical sin. You wouldn't think that to walk round here of an afternoon, <laughs> would you? Maybe this is where Berlusconi got the idea of a Bungay Bungay party from. <laughs> now, there's even a board game available here based on the black dog in which the dog has to collect biscuits and bones. So, isn't that love? That's a nice thing for the family to all do together at Christmas, isn't it? All sit around playing a game going, Oh dear, I've rolled three sexes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm damned to spend an eternity in unimaginable soulless torture. It's run old, doing it? The other historical event still commemorated here is the Great Fire of Bungie that burnt the place down in 1688. I, I have to confess, I'm sorry, until I came here, I am, I'm afraid I'd never heard of the Great Fire of Bungie. Um, obviously, I'd heard of the Great Fire of London, which was only a couple of years earlier, so I can only presume the one here was just one of those copycat Great Fires. <laughs> there is an attention here, uh, I think, even though the town is... is very small, it is divided as well, because you go past the Buttercross and you get to the area that doesn't have the posh shops, because it's the working class bit. Oh, it's quite an achievement, I think, for a town to be split between a common area and a posh area when the whole place is only 50 yards long. But... <laughs> But there is one establishment that does seem to be at the heart of this divide. I was told by one resident, let me give you some advice. If you wish to stay alive, stay out of the three tons. Because <laughs> the three tons is in the centre of town, it's a big old pub with hundreds of rooms, and it, it often seems to have been at the centre of social issues here. In 1822, it was used as a prison to detain local Luddites after they smashed up farm machinery at Woodron. Now, I know this is just my prejudices, but it's hard to imagine revolutionary movements around here, isn't it? <laughs> I bring revolutionary greetings from Yoxford. <laughs> Before that, though, the three tons was used for an unusual reason for a pub. Uh, a lad called Henry Skull was murdered by robbers. So Henry Skull's employer decided to display Henry's body in the three tons and charge people a penny to see it to pay for the funeral. Because if you've got a function room, it's a shame not to use it. Isn't it? <laughs> now, I've no idea whether this is connected in any way, but the Three Tons is also said to be the most haunted building in Bungie. There are supposed to be 20 ghosts there, including Rex Bacon, who in 1682 discovered his wife having an affair with a man upstairs, so he killed them both and hung himself from the landing, and a maid who was caught stealing beer, so was chained to the wall until she starved to death. What sort of a pub is this? <laughs> Wednesday night's quiz night. We have a jazz band on a Friday. And on a Monday, we disembowel a shepherd. <laughs> with a finger buffet. <laughs> now, I went um, round the three tons yesterday. 
Because uh, an amazing story to it. In 1969, the Three Tons hired a professional exorcist, Canon Pierce Higgins, who claimed to have got rid of all the ghosts, but now people say that the ghosts are still there. So they'll have to get another exorcist, presumably. He'll come round and go, oh, blimey, who you had in here? <laughs> 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 what, that Higgins? Oh, blimey, he's a cowboy, I'll tell you what you've got to have. All. <laughs> See this ectoplasm, you've got to have all that out, mate. <laughs> so has anyone else seen ghosts in there in the three tons? No, no. I was there the night when you were taught by the exorcist in 69. Were you? You were there on the night of the exorcist? The, the man who you're talking about, Higgins, I think his name, uh, he was blind, so he never saw a ghost anyway. <laughs> the row that's gone on the longest in Bungie, historically, is over the Outney Common. Now, usually you think of battles over using common land as happening hundreds of years ago, but here they went on until 1979, because it turned out that the common had never been registered as a common, and some landowners put in a claim that it was theirs, and so there was a demonstration through the town. Now, I mean, the first problem here, I would have thought, is that Bungie's hardly big enough for a protest march, is it? You'd set off, what do we want? Oh, we've arrived. <laughs> Well, the normal demonstration chance wouldn't work here anyway, because it'd go, when do we want it? Well, there's no rush. <laughs> now, there's a, there's a picture that I saw of this demonstration, and there was a chap called Billy Barber, who was 81 on the demonstration, carrying a placard. And the placard said, I quote on the placard, Many of my school pals gave their lives for freedom. The common is their heritage. Where are the Judases who would betray them in order to kneel at the feet of Mammon? <laughs> on a placard! <laughs> Not so much a slogan as an essay. It's brilliant. Uh, in the end, there was a court case in 1979 which the landowners won. Uh, so they now own the common, and the campaign had to pay around £25,000. Now, you know, obviously, I have to take a neutral position, so I can only say that the court rejected the claims of Billy Barber and his friends and sided instead with the greedy, dirty, ravenous, selfish, pompous, money-grubbing, antisocial, inhumane, heartless, self-aggrandising tyrants instead. <laughs> Obviously, I have to stay neutral. <laughs> but there's something marvellous about the fact that the enclosures, which everywhere else is something that you do in history at school with the Battle of Waterloo, here came after the Sex Pistols. <laughs> <laughs> the next protest will be when people go, you heard what they're planning with these corn laws? <laughs> Uh, the Common also played a part in the Second World War because hundreds of American airmen were based there, which must have seemed amazing. People must have said to them, so you're from way out west, are you? What, past this? <laughs> uh, now, this is where I'd like to introduce the town crier, Les Knowles. Les, you remember this period of the, the American airmen being based on the Common in the yeah. Second World War? Yeah, I was a young lad then, and I had a paper out, and... Uh, one particular day, the American came out and he said, I've got a half a crown, boy, and news the world. I said, uh, oh, I've got no change. Bearing in mind, the news of the world was a broadsheet, which cost about tuppence. I've got no change. Ah, oh, don't worry about the change, boy, keep it, he said. So, of course, we never ever had any change after that. Good <laughs> <laughs> uh, job they didn't find out. God knows what they would have done to your voicemail. <laughs> Is it true that the, the Americans were... They were probably quite popular with the women of Bungie, were they? Oh, yes, I, tell, well, I won't yeah. go into that. <laughs> Young lads, we used to play in the woods and on the common, and uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> so, so there's probably a, at least half the audience here is a descendants. <laughs> <laughs> descendants of those days. <laughs> Round of applause for Lee. 
Something else that people might be surprised about is Bungie's industry. Uh, there's a brewery, and most impressively, there is a massive old print works that prints more books than any other printers in Britain. And it's the most unlikely place, I think, that you would expect to find here. Even when I was being shown round past all the presses, there was a bit of me that was thinking, there must be somewhere here where you slaughter turkeys. It just... <laughs> I mean, I think it's impressive that Clay's is still as important as it is. This is what impressed me most, though, about it. It seems that the Harry Potter books were printed there, which is why it was reported that, and I quote, The betting website Blue Square, which is running a book on the question of which character will be bumped off in the next Harry Potter book, has recently been inundated with punters wishing to place bets on the demise of the Hogwarts headmaster Dumbledore. But eyebrows were raised when it transpired that most of the bets originated from Bungie. (laughs) The town which is coincidentally home to the printers, Clays, who produced the previous five books in the series. Tinkers! <laughs> Did it not occur to people that someone might notice this? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Did some people not get more ambitious and go into William Hills and go, I'd like 50 quid on Snape being turned into a frog on page 163? <laughs> Just a hunch. <laughs> I wonder if did some people go in and say, can I have a treble of Dumbledore dying, a Pakistani bowl and a no ball in the ninth over, (laughs) and Alf from number 15 being next year's Reeve. (laughs) So I think you should be proud of this, though. This is part of the charm of here. It looks all innocent and bungy in bloom, but when you look closer, it's all a little bit dodgy. It's good, it's peculiar. I mean, some people here might say Bungie isn't peculiar, but those people would have to explain how it's normal to have a chicken roundabout. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Honestly, when I first heard about the chicken roundabout, I was, I confess, a little bit confused. I... For a while, I thought it meant that there were just so many chickens here that they had to have their own traffic system. <laughs> But it turns out that there was a roundabout, a human traffic roundabout, that chickens lived on. But the chickens thrived there for many years, partly because they were looked after by Gordon, who became known as the Chicken Man of Bungie. Now, I I met with Gordon yesterday, and he he is an absolute delight. Sadly, he's a bit too frail to come out at the moment. But with me is Jenny Cook, uh, who helped Gordon keep the chickens happy and thriving on the roundabout. So first thing I will ask you, Jenny, is like, so how did it come about that there was a a chicken roundabout? Um, Chickens have been there for over 100 years. Obviously, there wasn't a roundabout there then. (laughs) But Gordon, he used to put a little bit of food down, and then one day um, a sack of corn fell off the back of a lorry. (laughs) (laughs) And so he started to feed them and somebody said to him, well, they'll think it's Christmas. And so he said, well, why can't it be Christmas every day? And so he started to feed them. And this was for years, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, it's over 20 years ago and uh, it's a four-mile round trip. And I mean, he's in his 70s and uh, walked all that distance with his wheelbarrow. His favourite form of transport is wheelbarrow. (laughs) (laughs) Well, to be fair, it is the quickest form round here. I, think... so I actually came across him one day, was driving up the road trying to find him, and I just saw this wheelbarrow at the side of the road with two legs sticking out of it. <laughs> and uh, I stopped and I said, are you OK, Gordon? He said, yeah, he's just having a rest. So <laughs> Everybody absolutely loves Gordon. I mean, he still walks through the town with his wheelbarrow because he goes shopping with his wheelbarrow. <laughs> The, the council weren't necessarily all that fond of the chicken roundabout, uh, were they? Back in 2000, um, they basically wanted to evict the chickens from the roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> and so a local newspaper took up the campaign with Gordon and um, people dressed up as, in chi- as chickens <laughs> and paraded up and, and around the roundabout and it was on national news and in the press and, um, and eventually the council had to back down. Well, uh, thanks, Jenny, and also thanks very much, Gordon. Thank you very much. (laughs) Spectacularly, though, Bungie, the chicken roundabout 
is possibly not necessarily the most peculiar aspect of the town because there's also a sport that is associated with here called dwell flunking which involves a group dancing in a circle while someone stands in the middle with a cloth soaked in beer on a pole which is launched and has to be landed on one of the dancers and if they miss they have to drink a pint of beer. <laughs> you know when people from rural Suffolk complain about their image? <laughs> you don't always help yourselves. For anyone who doesn't know the rules of dwell flonking, if there is any such person, I'll read out part of the official World Dwell Flonking regulations. When the circle is in position, a flonker from the other team picks up the driveller and goes into the centre of the circle. The referee calls for a dwell to be thrown to that flonker and then shouts, Here you go together. <laughs> And blows his whistle. This is the cue for the circle to start girting and for the flonker to spin round and with a shout of dwiles away to flonk his dwile. Do you think they'll have it in the Olympics? <laughs> there is one resident here, though, that we haven't yet mentioned, placing Bungie at the centre of international news. Because when Julian Assange found himself unpopular with certain governments for exposing all their secrets through WikiLeaks, he decided to come and hide out in Bungie. <laughs> I would imagine, he thought, this is a place that manages to leak the plot of unpublished Harry Potter books. <laughs> it sounds like a place for me. <laughs> now, obviously, Julian has not been able to work as freely as he'd like here, but he has still been operating WikiLeaks uh, while he was here, so I can leave you tonight with his latest report that he's put together from secret documents leaked from the parish council. <laughs> 9th of August. Secret defence plans to be enacted in the event of a preemptive strike from enemy territory of Beckles. In the event of such an occurrence, the castle walls will be deployed to confuse the hostile forces. <laughs> As they are working out how to walk round our wall, we will pour vats of boiling hot chocolate from the cafeteria <laughs> over the oppressor. 1st of September. A D notice is to be issued to the editor of the Beckles and Bungie Echo, barring all mention of the recent failed operation in which two of our councillors ran from the three tons screaming, I'm not going in there, there's a ghost. <laughs> 17th of September. Top secret directive issued that Bungie special forces are authorised to be immediately dispatched to track down and without prejudice eliminate any individual whatsoever who has publicly denigrated, brought into disrepute, or in any sense taken the mickey out of the very serious post of Reeve. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening, Bungie. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Mark Steele's In Towns was written and performed by Mark Steele with additional material by Pete Sinclair. The producer was Sam Bryant. <laughs>